Now the recording has started. Take it away, Bernard. Okay, so this is the May virtual interim of the W3C WebRTC Working Group. It'll be two hours this time. Just a reminder that we abide by the W3C IPR policy and only people and companies that are listed at the link are able to make substantive contributions. So we have a lot to cover at this meeting. Uh, display media capture handle, screenshot API, conditional audio suppression, region capture, WebRTC encoded transform, and media capture transform. Um, do we have a volunteer for taking notes? These are, doesn't have to be too detailed, not everything everybody said, but just the decisions and next steps, action items, things like that. Yeah, if nobody else is going to do it, I can take some notes. Okay, thank you, Tim. All right. Uh, just a reminder, the meeting is being recorded and it will be made public. Thank you very much. Just to check, we don't need to have the notes on IRC or just? Uh, well, you can do it on IRC, but um, we'll also post them on the wiki. So if I just take them in a in WordPad or something, that's fine. Yeah, I think that's okay. Any, any uh, does Dom, Dom have any, any objection to that? Okay. All right, so this is the agenda. Just a little bit of a warning. We're gonna do more strict time control. Uh, Harold will be the bouncer. Um, so we're gonna give a warning two minutes before your time is up. And then once the time is elapsed, we will move on to the next item. So it's gonna be fairly strict because we've been running out of time and people get angry that they don't get a time to present what they wanna present. Okay, so uh, next session is a lot for 25 uh, minutes or so. I'll turn it over to you, Elad. Thank you very much. Uh, can everybody hear me? I've just uh, joined from my other account. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so uh, this is about capture handle. Capture handle is a way for two uh, for two applications running in two different tabs to communicate, uh, but to communicate just a bit of information that needs to jump start the rest of their communication, and it also assumes that they're already communicating in one way. Let me get to that in a second. So uh, let's assume that we've got one VC application. Uh, it could be Google Meet, or let's call it VC Max. So that's an application, a fictional application that we have. And it's capturing, using Get Display Media, another tab uh, that's running an application like Microsoft uh, Forcepoint or OpenOffice 365 or anything else. Let's just call it presentation application. So two applications, VC capturing uh, a productivity suite. Next slide, please. So um, now uh, let's assume that the application that is a presentation application all uh, has all sorts of APIs for getting a message saying, hey, I want you to change to the next uh, slide or I want you to change to the, change to the previous slide, go into a uh, full screen, leave full screen, anything we can imagine. But what exactly uh, it has is out of scope. Let's just assume that it has previous and next slide just because that's easy. And we also assume that this depends on a session ID, right? Because you don't want to change the slides on somebody else's uh, uh, session. And let's also assume that there is some kind of uh, identification or authentication that is taking place, and that's outside of our scope. But the very minimum that we can assume is needed is a session ID. And when I start capturing something with Get Display Media, I don't generally know what I'm capturing. It's up to the user to decide. And I might know that I captured the tab, but I don't know what tab, who's running there, et cetera. So that's what I want to uh, focus on. How can we uh, discover safely um, a reasonable amount of information to allow collaboration, if collaboration is possible between these two applications? Uh, next slide, please. So uh, one hacky way of doing that, that you could do right now without any changes to any browser, is that uh, the application that thinks, hey, I might be captured, it could just show a QR code, and whoever ends up capturing it could just read that QR code, extract whatever information it wishes out of that, and then use that. So for example, it could get a session ID, and then through some shared backend, it could try to authenticate and say, hey, I want to start communicating with this session. If it has permission, it could, and then it could start over that secure channel, sending next slide, previous slide, et cetera. Um, 
So that would already work, uh, but it has many uh, downsides. First, it's not ergonomic. Second, it's not efficient because when you capture something, you have to continuously uh, scan and try to read this QR code, which of course doesn't have to be a full blown QR code. It could be something a lot more minimal and less user visible. It could just be a couple of pixels, uh, but you still need to uh, scan them every at every iteration. And it's also uh, ripe for disruption, unintended even, just by somebody else drawing to that particular part of the screen. And last of all, um, you, uh, you all, when you're capturing, you always need to take into account that, hey, uh, whatever I think I'm reading, not, none of it is verified, right? I need to verify all of it out of bend somehow. Uh, for example, I could verify a session ID by trying to open a communication channel with that whoever has the channel and they need to, to like they could display an, a, you know, a challenge and the response or anything like that. Next slide, please. So what I'm suggesting is that we uh, say, okay, if this is already possible, uh, let's try to make it better. Uh, first of all, uh, of course, this needs to be opt-in, right? The application will not, uh, like some of my previous suggestions, would not just always expose its, uh, um, uh, actually not my suggestion, but never mind. Uh, not always uh, expose its title or anything like that, but rather it would have to say, hey, I want to expose and here are the things I want to expose and here's who I'm willing to expose it to. So two uh, things it could expose, it could expose its origin and it could expose a self-selected string that would often be a session ID of some sort that's meaningful to it. And the next thing is it needs to be able to say, hey, uh, I want these origins or maybe any origin to be able to read the information I'm exposing. And I'll get back to that, why that is useful a bit later. Uh, and then on the capturing app, uh, you will say, hey, here's what I'm capturing. So I'm capturing uh, meet.google.com, I'm capturing slides.google.com or any other thing. And here's the session ID that it, it claims. Uh, now, one benefit here is that at least part of this information is automatically verified. So because the origin, the browser can guarantee that you cannot expose somebody else's origin. So basically, when you're exposing, you just say, do I want to expose my origin, yes or no? you don't self-report the origin. And then uh, once you know that the session ID or anything else that is coming is coming from you to you from a verified origin, then you could choose to trust or not trust it. So for example, if one Microsoft application captures another Microsoft application, maybe it chooses to say, okay, whatever information is delivered in the handle, we deem that to be trustworthy or not. It's up to them. Uh, next slide, please. So here is uh, just one illustration of how this could be used. So let's say that you're on the captured side and you're some kind of presentation application. So you call set capture handle config, meaning that's my capture handle. That's what I would like to show. You could say expose origin true. You could say false. Uh, then the handle can be anything. It could be a session ID or it could be any other string. Maybe here we see a user, uh, user readable, uh, human readable string that says, hey, go here to understand what kind of API you have uh, you could use with this particular ID. And here's the ID as part of it. And that could be parsed on the capture inside. And then we say permitted origins is any origin, just to make it simple. Next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, and then on the capture inside, we could say, okay, I called get display media, I got something. If, so missing from this example is the part where you say, okay, is this a tab? And then if it's a tab, okay, is it exposing a handle? And once it, I see it's exposing a handle, I could say, okay, is it one of a several collaborating applications I know? And if it is, then I'm gonna parse the handle in a certain way, extract the session ID, and then run whatever code I want. Like maybe I create an adapter for a previous and next with whatever API I know that particular application happens to have. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so one thing uh, to note here is that actually you could even drop the exposing the origin part if you wanted to, because if your ID is sufficiently unique, uh, then you could just get a value and go and talk to whichever server, the only collaborating application or a small number of collaborating applications you have and say like, hey, is this ID, does that belong to you by any chance? 
and then you could use that to establish uh, communication. Uh, but that's just a side note. Um, yes, so next, please. Uh, next slide, please, sorry. Yes, thank you. Uh, so uh, I've already implemented this and it's already going into origin trial in M92 of uh, Chrome. Of course, you know, we are open to feedback. This is just an origin trial, just an experiment. Uh, and this is what it looks like uh, on M92. Uh, the captured side says like, hey, here's what I would like to expose. Uh, and then the capturing side says like, hey, uh, I would like to either get notifications of whenever the handle changes, which can happen if you navigate and it can happen if you just load a different slides deck on the <laughs> presentation software or anything like that. Uh, or I could read the exact, uh, the one at the time which I wish. So you could either read it on get, uh, get set through get settings on a track that you already have, or you could register it to get new notifications when it changes in the future or both. Uh, next, please. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry. Um, Bernard, are you the one uh, controlling the slides? Bernard. Oh, sorry. Let's Bernard, see. we cannot hear you. Gives me some time to breathe. No, that's nice. I was going to ask for that in between topics. Should we take the opportunity to start some discussions or do you want to continue? Uh, uh, I could continue, uh, but I think uh, like Harald, is it possible for you to maybe take the reins on the slides or? I am working on it. Thank you very much. So uh, then uh, we want to think, okay, are there any privacy or security concerns with uh, an API of this shape? And my argument is uh, no. And I think it is uh, because of the following. So first, it's opt-in, so you could very easily just not use it. Second, it's user-driven, so it hardly ever takes effect. It's only when the user actually starts a display capture, and we don't allow, we don't influence the decision in any way. It's completely user-driven. Uh, then, uh, theoretically, it's a no-op because it's already possible, just not as ergonomically. Um, yeah. So now I just need to make sure that everybody's looking at the second presentation because soon they're going to uh, shift out of uh, alignment with one another. Uh, so next, it's more robust than steganography. So uh, uh, that's nice, because, but that's not really a privacy or security issue, but it's good to have that, right? Uh, once you uh, start relying on the mechanism, you would like it to be robust. Uh, next, uh, the capture of the app. Um, the one uh, misunderstanding of this could be that uh, maybe the capture of the app realizes that it's being captured, and the answer, no, it, it's not. It only discovers it, it, it's being captured if the capturer decides to tell it, which is A, already the case, uh, and B, perfectly fine, because all of the, um, anything that we could have against the captured application finding out, uh, is because it could mess with the capturing application. But if they're collaborating, if they choose, if the capturing application chooses to give that information to the captured application, that kind of pre-assumes that, uh, that this is okay by it. Uh, next, um, you could use a handle that's kind of partially opaque. So you could like write in a very understandable form exactly what you are. Uh, I'm Wikipedia article X, Y, Z, or you could have something that's only understandable if you have access to another API. Uh, last thing is, hey, this gives us uh, the ability to rely on the origin because you cannot spoof it. And one more thing is like, you could kind of worry that, hey, can I attack the capture by spamming it with events? And the answer is uh, no, because it's gonna cost you as much as it costs the capture that you don't even know exists. 
and the capture could avoid that by just not registering to read your handler. So, and it could always deregister that handler. Um, next slide, please. Uh, yes, so previous slide, please. Uh, and that was what I had to say. I will uh, shift the mic over to Yanivar later, but first I wonder if there are any um, other input from people. This is, this is Yuen. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so a few thoughts there. Uh, first, the name might be a bit too generic. Capture, when people think about capture, they're thinking about camera and microphone, or maybe that's my bias. Uh, there, it's very specific to screen capture. So um, maybe we could like bike shade uh, a name that is that has more focus and more meaning. Um, more importantly, I'm worried about the case where the origin is not exposed. Um, I think that the use cases that you care about or like the general use cases, probably uh, people will be okay exposing the origin. So I would not provide the option to not expose the origin at first at least until we have like uh, a good reason to, to to start not exposing uh, the origin. The reason is that you're passing uh, some arbitrary data from one web page to another. And if you do not pass the origin, then uh, you get data from an untrusted source and it's becoming a bit more complex. Uh, and people might want to say, like in, in your web ideal, it's uh, expose origin by default equals false, which I don't think is the right thing to do. I, I would start very simple, uh, not e always expose the origin. And if people start to come up to come to us saying, hey, I want to not show my origin, then we can talk with them. Um, otherwise, I think that uh, I, I'm not exactly sure whether we want like this even mechanism. But uh, other than that, if, if we have a one time blob of data that is exposed from uh, the capturing to the capture page, I think it's it's probably fine. Um, I look forward for the applications to actually use that in meaningful ways so that we can validate that. Um, so for applications to uh, use that in a, a meaningful way, I think that we will be able to uh, show some examples very soon. Um, and for uh, I just want to uh, mention that this is not one time, as you said, because uh, once you capture a tab, the tab can be navigated, which means that even if you wanted to force, like, an, uh, like for example, if we take a slides deck, once you navigate away, you don't want to keep on sending messages to the old thing that you no longer have on screen. You might want to send it to the new uh, slides deck to which you have navigated. I Maybe. Maybe it's a, it's a complex use case. Uh, I would say that in most cases, navigation will probably not happen. Uh, and also, uh, if you have tight coordination between one and the other, uh, you might be able to navigate to an all, to all also a collaboration destination anyway. So you might be able to reconcile things in, in some ways. I, I'm not. It's something that that is doable outside w without this uh, event mechanism anyway. So I, th I, so think I, I, I would start very simple and reduce a little bit the, uh, the the scope of the API as well there, just to start very simple and which should cover hopefully like most of the cases. Uh, I agree with uh, simple, but not too simple. So for example, uh, saying that uh, exposure of origin is. Uh, uh, happens automatically is something I, I need to think about a bit more, but I'm more open to that because it does not uh, reduce the usefulness of the feature. Uh, but when to say that it is one time, I think is 100% problematic because navigation can happen to another website through the URL bar. So it's not controlled by the app in any way. The user just moves it. Uh, and it could be to another collaborating or non-collaborating uh, site. Uh, so, and the browser does not know, right? So the browser needs to say, hey, this capture handle no longer applies. I'm, you don't have to keep polling me. I'll give you an event so you know you've just, uh, it no longer applies and maybe something new is going to apply in a second or maybe not. 
Um, maybe that, that that's something we could discuss. In that case, if you really want to go with an event, I'm not sure that settings is the right way of doing things. Uh, maybe we should invent something new. Um, <laughs> Because it does seem a, a bit odd that you have settings that will change and then you, you need an event somewhere else. So it seems like a really new mechanism. If we want to go with settings, I, I would go with something that is not mutable and uh, be done with it. Uh, I'm not sure I understood because uh, for settings, that was if you want to read the capture handle at the moment. And then if you want to register an event handle, the event handle is on the track, not on the settings. And then when you get an event, the event includes the new capture handle. So basically every time the capture handle changes, you get it with the event. So you don't actually have to call get settings at any time. OK, so get settings would not change then. It would be immutable. No. <clears throat> exactly, it's yes. A, it's exactly the same pattern that's we use, use for state reading. We, we offer an attribute to read the state, and then we offer an event that includes the, the value of the state at the moment. Precisely. So I think uh, uh, Tim Yes, added. so, OK. So I, I would just say that uh, we have a, an attribute for that, and we have an event. And I would follow the same pattern in, in terms of trying to go with get settings. But, but that's that's an API, like, small uh, by chat, I guess. Uh, Tim, do you want to say something? Yeah, just to clarify. Do you, does this always get sent? Is this always through a server so that they can only collaborate via the server? They can't collaborate via the page. Not necessarily. Uh, so, for example, if you're capturing another tab that happens to be in the same origin, you could use a broadcast channel. Uh, so, this does not really talk about how you're going to use the session, just how you discover what you've captured. And then you establish communication in a completely orthogonal way. I just aim to give you a strong enough way that it would apply to as many scenarios as possible. OK, but if you don't expose the origin, then you're making it impossible to do that. Uh, yes and no. I mean, you could think that, OK, if I'm capturing, if you're talking specifically about capturing the same origin tab, uh, then, then you could just, on a broadcast channel, say, like, hey, I captured X. Does that belong to you? you guys? Yeah, okay. Exactly. So you could. OK, thanks. Yeah, I think Jan Ivar uh, wanted to speak next. Uh, yeah, so uh, I have some minutes after too, but I just want to talk specifically about this. So <clears throat> I, I do agree this is a, a useful problem to solve. I think uh, this is this is uh, part of the things we need to solve to have better integrated web presentations. However, I'm a little uh, concerned because the working group has already decided to pursue Get Viewport Media as the integration point for better integration on the web. <clears throat> so uh, I, I would disagree with that. Uh, OK. Uh, I, I, think we I would agree that the, the work group has, uh, has agreed to, to pursue uh, mm -hmm. get report media. I would not agree that it has, has agreed that it, uh, that it is the only solution that <clears throat> we, are, we are pursuing, and that the problem it solves oh. is the only problem mm -hmm. we're solving. So All right. Uh, let me continue a, then. Uh, to be precise. OK. Uh, well, I would say that the reasons we chose <clears throat> to pursue Get Viewport Media was to solve uh, the fact that capturing a web surface is the most uh, scary source that you can uh, capture through Get Display Media. And that was deemed, uh, uh, and that, that's caused a lot of grief because uh, it's led to pushback against things like making web sources the default and pickers. So uh, what I'm missing here is the solution that is organized around Get Viewport Media. And I'll have a slide on that. But um, and also, the so what I worry is introducing this API. Uh, it seems like we're introducing multiple solutions that are per perhaps competing. Uh, and this solution would then uh, enshrine more the idea that, what does it say about the working group and what it intends to, to signal? Uh, what is the intended API that people should use what for capturing web surfaces. <clears throat> um, uh, and specifically on the API, uh, in your earlier slide, you said the discussion scope is discovery of the generic bare essentials. I also think uh, this API could be smaller. Uh, I agree it should always include the origin and maybe uh, even have a browser produced ID <clears throat> to lessen. Um, I'm not very keen on having another uh, 
communication channel potentially where uh, it, we have to validate a lot of long inputs. If we have an unlimited string that JavaScript can insert into any API, it's going to be abused one way or the other. Uh, sure. So first, it, it does not have to be uh, unlimited, right? So and the implementation wise, I we've limited it to I think 1,024 uh, characters, and we could discuss what the right limit should be and whether it should be throttled. Maybe you're not allowed to change it more than you know a certain amount of time. Maybe there's a leaky bucket until the next update. All of this can be discussed. But um, going back to the point of uh, get viewport media, uh, I will repeat uh, repeat what Harold said, but with less gravitas. And that is that uh, we have not agreed yet that get viewport media should supplant uh, get display media. And if we all and you've agreed too that this is a useful thing to have, then I don't think that we should delay giving that to the web because we have plans for 2023 for get viewport media. And also, I think that this is healthy competition between the two APIs because I think that you could see how both of them would exist. Uh, I don't really think that it has to be one or the other. And if it is, no, no, then... uh, I... yeah. no, no, I'm sorry. Yes, I have well... a tendency to go on. No, no, uh, I think I, I, I phrased myself poorly. <clears throat> what, what I meant with Get Viewport Media was rather an approach that relied on um, uh, better security uh, foundations like uh, site isolation and opt in to capture. That to me is the main thing that I think we had a breakthrough on in the working group that we could provide a, a better integrated web presentations in a safer way. And uh, I, I, I would like an API like this uh, to work in conjunction with that, but I would perhaps want to limit it to site isolation and opt in capture. Uh, then I think that once we have Get Viewport Media, then we can discuss whether this uh, API still applies and how we could move off of it if we believe it to be uh, detrimental. But right now, I think that uh, it is very useful. And I don't really see how it could be abused. And I'm open to, uh, to listening. Uh, but right now, especially the suggestion of having a browser assigned ID, which makes everything less powerful and requires an additional, maybe we could uh, jump into your slide and you could give uh, the full presentation of what, what you suggest so other people would have a better picture of what I'm responding to. Sure. Yeah. Uh, let's do that. You currently have no five other. minutes ahead of time, so 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 you you're allowed to switch to Yaniva's uh, page if you want to. If I'm allowed to go back after, then I, I would <laughs> gladly do that. You have a slide following it. All right, uh, Bernard also has his hand up. I think. Uh, yeah, but uh, my question is probably going to be uh, partly answered by your slide. So let's go to that slide. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Sure. Thanks. Okay. Next slide. Slide. So yes, yeah, so this is my crystal ball slide, which you should never uh, contribute to the internet because it's a prediction, <clears throat> and that's in two years we'll see, and it'll be out there and be either totally correct or totally false. So I'm 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 getting I'm doing a crystal ball moment of what would it look like in two years time? Let's say we have both get display media still with a picker, and we have get viewport media so that uh, websites. Uh, can capture their own uh, surface and do it safely. And, and as a result, all major presentation websites use site isolation, and they opt into HTML capture. <clears throat> Excuse me. This means they can capture themselves using Get Viewport Media with permission from the user. And the use case there is the user clicks a button in the presentation program to join an integrated meeting. And that's the starting point. They're actually in the presentation program. Um, but also, uh, the same sites can register for preferential positioning and treatment in Get Display Media because Get Display Media will still have a picker, but it's a new picker, which um, promotes and relegates uh, it promotes uh, well-conforming major presentation websites that are site isolated and opt in to capture and giving them the primary position in the picker, and then relegates all non-conforming choices to under this sort of other option. And uh, the way they register for this would be similar to what uh, Elad proposed. Uh, I just used the little different words here. Uh, you know, register intent presentation, because that's what the API really is. It's a way to what Get Display Media has is a powerful picker that's built into the browser. And uh, while Get Viewport Media is great when you're already on the permission page and integrate meetings that way, there's still an unsolved problem of what if you're still in the video conferencing presentation program. And you want to pick your presentation like we do today. 
So there's a we need to better integrate web presentations there as well. And doing so in a safe way means promoting these uh, these web apps, if you will, that register their register their intent to be a presentation program to appear in that picker. And then here you would also get an ID back similar to uh, which could be used in a similar way to what Ella described. Uh, and it would be exposed in the in the track of the capturer so that you could then correlate and do uh, necessary things like uh, what we've integrated uh, next slide, previous slides, and all those nice things. And all major presentation websites will be using site isolation and opt into HTML capture because these APIs are not available otherwise. And that leads us to a safer web. So that's my cell. Uh, so one thing that I've not written down and I think I've not said before is that uh, if we look at it from the um, VC applications point of view, I don't think that they would ever agree uh, to let go of being able to, ca to capture an arbitrary tab. They would never be sure. able to say, okay, we can only uh, capture something that uh, collaborates with us, calls get view viewport media on our behalf and then shares it with us. That is way more than 2023, I think. So they will always have the, the, uh, the flow that starts with the current uh, with the VC application and captures an arbitrary other surface. And in the case that this uh, surface is a tab, which uh, I can tell you is quite often, uh, at least for Chrome users, um, in that case, uh, we would want what I suggest. Now you say, okay, we could massage that uh, to an intent and an ID and here I would request the next slide, please. Uh, so uh, to the intent thing, I have to say, it, it sounds like just an invitation to have applications jockey for position, potentially even by making false claims, uh, saying I'm a presentation slash a video game uh, slash productivity suite slash whatever, please put me here or whatever. So, I don't think that we should rely on that in order to determine position in the picker in any way. Uh, so that's number one. And for the uh, browser assigned ID, I would say that um, that I, I just don't see why it's necessary. I know why, why it's uh, detrimental, and that is that uh, it forces another translation uh, step, right? And it also means that you have to have collaboration over a cloud, whereas if you have an arbitrary string, you might be able to say all you want to say, and that's it. Like you could say, "Hey, I'm a bank. Try not to uh, uh, try to warn the user that he might not have select uh, really wanted to capture me. He's probably made a mistake." Or you could say, uh, "You know, I'm not going to give you my session ID, but here's an API that you could use." There could be a lot of things that you could say that would be uh, useful without a shared backend. So first, you're blocking all of those. The ones that do have a shared backend, you're enforcing an additional step, whereas maybe you could speak, you could talk to each other with a broadcast channel. Now, no, that's not good enough. Um, actually, the broadcast channel, I guess you could use if you are same origin. Yeah? You could ask, like, who is that? So I take back that particular argument, sorry. Uh, and you're also, uh, with the browser assigned ID, you're no longer exposing the uh, the origin, unless you mean to. You also meant to add that, which maybe you have. Um, so maybe you meant to say, okay, so first you have to opt in before you get the browser assigned ID, and then you get both the browser assigned ID as well as the origin. But in that case, why is the browser assigned ID browser assigned? Like, what are we protecting against? And if you have something we're protecting against, so, I, I, I might become the new champion of your particular approach. But right. they are boring. <clears> that. So let, let me Why? respond. Though. Let me respond. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes. So I think what uh, viewers should look at here is uh, which, whether you have a browser assigned uh, ID or uh, an application provided ID, what is the smallest surface that does the job, that does the bare essentials? And my argument is only that all you need is a browser ID and it's a simpler API. Now, as far as um, uh, jockeying for precision, what is the order of uh, tabs that are shared in the picker in Chrome today? So uh, first, I'll say that this is a user agent. Uh, you could do a different order if you would like. But the mm -hmm. order right now is order of last uh, activation by the user. So it's not alphabetical as you might have thought, sure. in which case you could jockey for precision. But the user, no, no, I'm not the saying user, that. that's a question. So, 
Okay, no, oh, I'm sorry, right. that was a so, different view. Somebody in the audience. Uh, no, I, I just meant to say that uh, we can keep that ordering. That's fine. But I don't see anything wrong with uh, if web pages have gone through the efforts of uh, site isolating themselves and uh, opting into capture, those are inherently safer to share. I see nothing wrong with giving that group, that bulk as a whole, preferential treatment over sites that haven't gone through that. I don't think that's going to lead to, as far as position within that group, uh, that remains the same. So, uh, so first. So, uh, 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 there are three minutes left on this topic. If anyone else wants to speak, I think we should uh, give them a chance. I would just mention now that I understand a bit more of a proposal that uh, the idea that you can update the session ID is really like a message channel one way. And we already have like a construct, which is a message channel, which is both ways. And we have window proxy we have service worker, clients, API. We have a lot of these APIs that allows one context to talk with another. So I, I would look at these constructs and see whether we should not try to reuse them or not, instead of trying to replicate a strange way of doing post message and on message. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, but I think that is a misunderstanding because all of the existing uh, uh, mechanisms like peer connection, et cetera, assume that you already know who you want to be talking to. Whereas here, you've got an existing uh, channel that lets you, you're basically getting all of the pixels off of whomever you're capturing, but you don't know who that is. So he can send you messages by Q embedded QR codes, et cetera, but you, you don't know who that is. So I'm not, uh, what I'm offering you here is not intended to be this communication channel, but rather an identification mechanism. I agree with that. I'm just saying that there's a bootstrap mechanism. But once there's a bootstrap mechanism, which is a wind time thing, then I don't see why we should reinvent like something which is very close to a one-way message channel. Sure. Uh, if we can have a bootstrap okay. mechanism that can change when the tab is navigated, that would work for me. Too. We have one minute left. Do we have understand what the next steps are and what the summary is of this? Well, I think uh, this is an interesting problem that we should definitely, the working group should definitely try to solve. Uh, but uh, I think the, the issues are whether what security properties should there be and uh, what's the scope of the solution for identifying how narrow does it need to be and uh, uh, anything else. Uh, oh, yeah, I think we also always should expose origin. I don't know where the idea came from to hide origin. Okay, we're out of time. Uh, we should go to the next okay. problem. We, we'll continue discuss, the discussion on this on this topic on the, on the list and in, in the bugs. But uh, generally, the reception seems positive. Okay. Next. No, I don't agree. I don't agree. I don't think there was enough time to discuss to know what the reception is. I, I mean, there was yeah, there, there, there were too many slides and not right. enough time for for getting anywhere. Well, okay, we let's move on. We now have even even less time for the next topic. Uh, candidate audio suppression. Ten minutes. Hello. Thank you. Uh, could you navigate to the slide? Uh, thank you. Uh, so let's uh, uh, let's imagine a post-COVID world in which we also have cheap and instantaneous travel, and therefore, instead of meeting remotely as we are right now, we're sitting in one room. Uh, maybe all of our companies got purchased, uh, acquired by the same company, and now we're all working together. And uh, we're sitting in a room, and we take uh, turns uh, presenting to a mutual, uh, to a shared uh, screen that's on the wall. And there is a PA system, a set of speakers, whatever. Um, so whenever so one of us starts uh, sharing, if we're sharing something with any media, we don't want the media to be playing both out of our respective laptops whoever shares at the moment, and the PA. So it would be nice if when we start capturing a tab, we could also say, hey, uh, kindly stop uh, um, <clears throat> relaying your audio to the local speakers. Uh, your, this is being captured, and we're doing something useful with that. Um, so what I'm proposing here is a, a new constraint called suppress local audio playback. Modulo uh, bike shed it on the name, of course. Uh, and uh, if we go to the next slide, we can see the current PR state. Uh, modulo some uh, new comments that uh, have just come in and I have not been able to address yet. Thank you, Yanivar. Uh, so basically, um, 
with, uh, with, uh, with this uh, constraint, we say, uh, no longer play this uh, your audio uh, of the capture tab over the speakers. Uh, but uh, one thing that we might want to consider is, okay, what if there are multiple captures? In which case we say, okay, uh, we resume audio playback on the local speakers when the last one to suppress goes away. So, which I think is relatively obvious. And one thing that Yaniva asked for is for us to explicitly say that the captured tab should not be made aware that it's been uh, audio suppressed, uh, which follows from the general principle of you don't want to let the tab know that it's been captured. So I 100% agree. Um, and once we find the right uh, wording for that, I'm open to. Uh, one question I had was uh, if there are any mechanisms currently that could discover that. Uh, but maybe this is like um, nitpicking kind of discussion that we could continue over the uh, presentation. So I'll open the floor now for feedback. Actually, uh, I can clarify that. Uh, it's actually not a, the reason there wasn't actually to uh, prevent the site from knowing it's captured, because uh, it would actually be able to read this from the setting itself. Uh, my concern was more about how it would be implemented, because I worry without that clarification, there's two potential ways a browser could implement it. One would be to basically uh, mute audio from the tab, uh, but the document is none the wiser that this is happening. And that's the one I think we want. The alternative might be that someone might misconstrue this to mean that you know, uh, uh, syncs like uh, you know, audio tracks and peer connection that audio would somehow mute, and that would be JavaScript observable. And I don't think that's what we want. So um, that, that's more of a clarification. And I think it already says that. Uh, it says, the, uh, what does it say? The user agent should stop relaying audio to the local speakers. So I just want to make sure that that's clear that it's done at the user agent level, not at the JavaScript level. Does that make sense? Um, that's OK by me. Uh, what did you mean by uh, get settings? Because that uh, maybe I misunderstood. <laughs> but get settings would be on the capturing side. So there we are exposing it, sure. right? So that's not up. So on, on the captured side, uh, Sorry, I, you're right. On the captured side, I don't think that the, uh, there is a way in JavaScript to mute the page. Uh, otherwise, I would not have suggested this particular thing because you could always okay. just send the message to the captured application saying like, "Hey, kindly uh, mute yourself." Uh, you are correct. Yeah. Yeah. So it does have the other nice property of not being uh, observable that you're being captured. So both both are true. Any other comments on this one? Bernard, you're on the queue. Yon, you are you are in the queue now, apparently. <laughs> okay. That's all right. Yeah, I see it. <laughs> okay. Um Suppress local audio playback. The, the name, I'm not quite sure, because you're not suppressing it. You're suspending it, and maybe it will resume at some point. So maybe the name is not uh, particularly correct, and we should change it. Um, my main question would be whether the user agent could not already do that in, in like 90, like in most cases or not. Uh, that's a question I have. For instance, uh, maybe this should be like the suppressed local audio payback should be true by default, meaning that if the page is starting capturing and you have a prompt and in the prompt you say, yeah, I want the audio to be captured, maybe the user agent should be smart enough to say, oh, I will suppress audio, local audio playback. Or maybe it will, it will, the user agent will wait to suppress local audio payback based on what the capturing page will do. If it's playing, this uh, local track, then it will suppress on the capturing track. Or maybe the user agent could provide UI to control that either on the get display media prompt or uh, on the tab icon where you can mute and mute uh, a page, for instance. So it seems like there are a potential for not doing that and maybe solving like most of the issue. So that's my question. Have you tried that? And what would be the use cases where it, it would not be possible to solve this uh, just at the user agent level? Yes. Uh, so so no. I, 
I, I can jump in a little bit and say that Firefox does actually have a mute icon in the tab. And this is why the PR says the user agent should stop relaying because we imagine that uh, it could actually, uh, since double muting states are a bad idea, that it could actually flip the state so that uh, users, if they wanted to, could flip the state manually. But I think st it's still useful to have a constraint to maybe uh, have the application provide its intent here. But you're so also, not, I also like the idea of making it true by default. So it's um, not really a constraint. It's more like a hint to the user agent to okay, maybe two minutes left. That is not observable. Um, I, I would like to answer you. And uh, so you and you said uh, three different things. Why not uh, just change the default behavior? And to that, I would say that uh, that would not really work because you could be capturing something just in order to record it and not in order to share it. So the, you could imagine that some cases you would want to, uh, to suppress uh, audio or suspend uh, local audio playback, sometimes not. So you cannot just change that. Uh, to add any UI elements, I think, is a very uh, open question. I think that we already have a very uh, big uh, kind of uh, picker, and it's going to be uh, too difficult. Uh, I, I don't think that any user agents, uh, UX people, are going to agree to that. I think they're going to. I think that's a bad idea. Uh, even if you were to say, to convince them that it's a good idea, you would probably want to influence the default state when the picker comes up, or maybe you want to. I, I don't we, think that. Will, you will probably need need to show to the user that you posed or you muted the page. Because you're you changing something that you, the user decided. The user decided to play audio on a page. And now, just okay, by clicking on another one minute button left. that is unrelated, you, the user agent will mute the, the page. There's one minute left. Do we know what the next steps are on this and the, what the conclusions are? Maybe uh, I should we uh, comment on if, the issue, at least. And we could continue the discussion on these specific issues. Uh, we could, but given that I have, if I'm not mistaken, 20 minutes for the next issue, I don't mind if we take two more minutes. If that's okay. Okay. Uh, okay cool. you, have, you have you have the time. You don't get it back. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so uh, I would say that um, sure, it's true that even after uh, the making the decision, the user needs to be made aware. Potentially, even be able to reverse that decision. Um, I think that. Uh, I don't think that a heuristic that's saying, hey, let's observe what the capturing page does and decide based on that is going to lead to a consistent and user. Uh, uh, the behavior that's going to come out of that is not going to be consistent for the user and they're going to be confused. Uh, imagine that you could also sometimes you know, hack the system by playing it locally, but at very low value volume, just so that you could suspend uh, the other one. It, Can I answer it, to that? Mm -hmm. So. The user will be sh will be shown a picker, and the user will click on share audio. And in some cases, the audio will disappear, and in some cases, the audio will not disappear. That's uh, prob that's potentially problematic to users. They will not understand why it's disappearing and why it's not disappearing. And it's the capturing web page that controls that now. So that that's why I'm a little bit hesitant to actually go down that road. Uh, that is true, but you could show the user like a flashing mute sign or something that shows, hey, the reason this tab is now muted is because, uh, and that is better than offering them a, a choice because offering a choice gives a uh, cognitive load. Uh, and, you know, whereas if you just say, hey, this happened, this is why, uh, that might be more something that UX people might be more amenable to. But yes, I agree that we could continue discussing this uh, on GitHub. Uh, in that case, um, I guess, next topic. OK, we're done here. Next slide. Let's find the right tab. But uh, as far as I didn't hear any other objections than UN, so if, if uh, UN and Elad can resolve this on GitHub, uh, I hope uh, we don't need to get back to the working group uh, at large. Sounds good. OK. Sounds good. Cool. Uh, so uh, third and last topic by me, uh, sorry for everybody, but I didn't get to uh, present last time and therefore I'm getting some time. Uh, hope you can uh, uh, weather this. Uh, so region capture. Uh, so let's assume that we've already uh, agreed on and spec get viewport media. Of course, there is an implicit decision here that get viewport media does not already do some cropping and I'll get back to that implicit assumption in a second. But assume that we have get viewport media that lets you get, capture the entire tab, everything on it, and uh, what now? So applications uh, can comprise multiple parts, and those multiple parts can be cross-origin from one another, and they can also kind of shift in size and location, especially if you 
change the size of the window, then the browser decides to move things around. So um, why is that important for us? Uh, let's see. Uh, if we could go to the next slide, please. Sorry, uh, the next slide, please. I am not sure how to uh, phrase this. Um, yeah. yeah, thank you very much. Uh, one less, I think. Yes. Uh, so let's assume that we've got this uh, particular collaboration between a productivity suite displaying presentations and the video uh, conferencing application that uh, draws the talking heads on the side. And so when you capture, let's say you're using the share me button that calls get viewport media, you're, what you want to capture is just the part that does the presentation. And moreover, you might only want to capture part of that because maybe there are some speaker notes that are also embarrassing if discovered. Uh, maybe it says, don't uh, bring up uh, whatever, which I didn't. Uh, so we want to be able to crop. And more than that, the crop needs to be very robust. Uh, it's a security slash privacy issue even, that you never accidentally crop incorrectly. Uh, so now we've got uh, two strong reasons about why we want to uh, crop into happen by the browser and not as part of the application. Uh, number one is performance, because the browser, instead of having to keep on handing over very big frames to the application, might uh, hand over frames that are a quarter of the size. So why not? Um, and the other reason is that uh, it's very difficult, uh, even impos almost impossible, uh, for two cross-origin um, cross frames to communicate their size and location on the, in the viewport when you change the window and make sure that you never miss crop even a single frame. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so we've agreed, uh, hopefully that, or at least we pretend agree while I'm speaking, uh, that the uh, browser needs to crop. Uh, and next slide, please. So uh, there have been some discussions between me and uh, Yaniva about, OK, uh, but who needs to, uh, maybe we don't need to crop, maybe get viewport media itself is going to crop. Just whichever frame you call get viewport media from, you only capture that frame. Uh, but I would like to remind everybody uh, that we're not talking about element level capture, because you would still be cropping. Uh, you would still only be capturing whatever the user can see. So occluded content is not going to be captured, and the occluded, occluding uh, content is still going to be capturing. So essentially, what we would be promoting here is a pattern whereby I have an invisible frame, or div, or whatever, behind all of the content. I massage it to be exactly the size I want, and then I uh, am able to capture whatever I want, even if it's not in my own frame. Uh, which is possible. So we don't get any of the intended security of O, but only capture the, uh, the, the frame, right? Be because it's impossible. It's very easy to hack the way around. But we're pushing developers uh, to manage their own capture region, which is dangerous because they are not aware that, oh, when, I'm, when the window changes, I'm going to miss crop a single frame. They don't care about that, and they might not even think that it's so terrible. But we would like to teach them to do better. So. I think that if we could, uh, a more developer-friendly solution would be something that would allow them for, to have an arbitrary capture cropping to an arbitrary target, but in a way that cannot uh, be used incorrectly. Next slide, please. Uh, so assuming, for the sake of argument, that we agree on all the previous points, the question is, OK, how do we indicate which arbitrary target we would like to uh, crop two. And then there are two or three options I could think of. Number one is just give a DOM node reference, right? Like many other APIs. But the problem is that this would not work cross origin. Uh, if you, it basically means that you cannot really get an arbitrary target. You can get an arbitrary target inside your own frame, which is weak, and then going to push people towards the hack we've just discussed. The other option is to use an AD. But then the question is OK, but the, no, the um, global attribute ID that, you know, the basic one is document global, not page global. Uh, to which I would say, okay, um, 
but maybe we could specify that it only applies if it's really page global. And it is trivial to get a page global ID if you want. You just randomize 128 bits, and it's very unlikely to not be global. Uh, and then we can have some definition of what happens if it's not global despite it having to be. Another option is to say, OK, let's add another idea, UUID uh, thing, which is kind of uh, a much bigger scope project. But it would be, what if uh, HTML elements just had a UUID that was assigned by the browser and therefore was guaranteed to be unique? And that's not so, uh, th that would work, I think. Uh, but it would be uh, kind of difficult to standardize that. But if we have this use case and maybe a couple of others, maybe we could uh, push that through. Uh, so, um, and of course, all of this assumes that, you know, you've got collaborating frames because they're on the same applica application and they just post message the ID from one to another. So maybe uh, the one that has the presentation says like, hey, to the VC one, by the way, if you ever want to capture a part of me, you probably want this part, here's the ID, something like that. And you just post message that across. Um, next slide, please. I need to uh, refresh my memory on which one is the last one. Uh, yeah, so I just wanted to remind uh, at some point that um, you could still get uh, the I crop my uh, to myself with this approach, right? Like these are not, it's not either or. You could still say like, hey, I've got an ID. I just supply that and I capture, to my, I capture myself only. So that works. And the other one I've already gone through over, and that is that we're not talking about element level capture. Uh, that's another tool. It's a useful tool, and we probably want to support both eventually, but I'm only talking about the current tool right now. Um, so, and then the last thing that I thought that we could uh, discuss before I uh, ask for feedback, uh, next slide, please, uh, is how do we, assuming that we use an ID, we, whichever ID we end up using, do we want to say, OK, as soon as capture starts, we say crop to this, in which case we don't need to have some kind of barrier to say, like, OK, and now cropping started. You just know that cropping was there all along. So you start cropping, and you can use the very first frame. Uh, but then it might be a bit more uh, difficult to say, OK, I want to change the target. That requires an additional API. And then if you've got the additional API, we might just want to support both uh, from the bat, uh, off of the bat. Uh, and that is one that says, OK, here's a track, start cropping to whatever, and then maybe you get a promise that resolves when you can guarantee that all the next frames are already going to be cropped or something like that. So we could synchronize that way. And then if we have that, uh, then it's kind of easy to say, OK, I don't want to crop to this. I want to crop to that. Uh, so I think that we probably want to support both uh, flows. And that's all I had to say. I uh, welcome feedback. All right, so <clears throat> I have some feedback uh, on the. Uh, you're totally right that the, the security properties are for the entire page, but I don't necessarily see that as a problem, and I definitely don't see it as a problem with only one of these solutions, because the only difference I see here is whether you post message an ID or you post message the track. It doesn't really seem. I mean, the same security properties apply, <clears throat> and as far as a security issue, I think it's already understood that um, an iframe will not be able to call this method uh, without being uh, having that permission delegated from the top page. So the top page is remains in control. And I think we just need to document the security, the security properties. <clears throat> and that is true with either solution. Like Just because I capture to a specific element doesn't give me any security properties, because that element can be behind, can be invisible, can be all kinds of things. Um, and also this idea that. Uh, uh, and I, I, I know we should also say we have agreement, which is good, that no one's proposing coordinates, which I love. So so at least there's that. Um, <clears throat> but um, I do worry that an element, whenever you relay out, the element can move, and we need to define what happens to the capture. This is why I think it's better. I think it would be more conservative to tie it to an iframe, because uh, we already changed the size of capture when the window changes dimensions, and I think that makes sense for iframes as well. If we go down to individual elements, that seems a little over specific to me. Um, th there is a difference between uh, posting a track and posting an ID. And that is that, that 
Um, when you're uh, posting the, uh, the, the question is basically, are you pushing the uh, developer towards saying, I, I don't want to call even capture from this. I'll just call it from behind, and I'll move it to whichever side, uh, size I want. And so let's take a step back. So let's suppose for the sake of argument that posting a track or posting ID is the same. You are still ending up with a, uh, a much more restrictive API if you say that whenever you cap, uh, call get viewport media, you automatically only get the iframe. What if I don't want to get the iframe? What if I want to get the entire tab? In that case, I have to have an, you know, an invisible iframe that spans the entire viewport, and then I have everything else either inside or what, whichever. So I kind of have to now contort my application so that there would be somewhere this gigantic iframe that I capture, assuming I don't even want to crop, right? Because you're suggesting that get viewport media would always crop to the iframe. Or you transfer the track from the top level domain. Yes, uh, in which case, uh, but that still assumes that there is an iframe or a top level that is the same size. And for some reason, you have to communicate with it, even though when you, um, it could be that you are embedding a page that you don't want to communicate with. Like you you just want to give it the uh, permission and that's it. Like I'm just hosting a site on uh, Glitch and whatever. And like, here's the uh, application. I don't need to know what you are. I just need to know that you've got all of the permissions you would like. Uh, uh, go nuts. But I don't have to communicate with you and start capturing tracks on your behalf and then transferring them to you. Well, there are security properties that would need to be documented for these things. So, But uh, you and you had a, your hand up? Um, yes, uh, just the first comment saying that you're saying we, we could provide both tools. Uh, when I, whenever I'm hearing we could provide both tools, I'm thinking, why should we provide both tools? We, we really need a good justification to provide both tools. That's the first oh. thing. The oh, which, second thing. Which two tools? I'm sorry. Uh, I, 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 in, in, in previous slide, you, you said there were two, two options. Uh, so I do not remember exactly, but. I, anyway. I think that what I said was more, more on the line of like, Let's provide only this tool, and it also gives you the functionality of the other tool. I say, uh, what I said was oh. like, if if you have an ID, if you only crop to an ID, you could always crop to self because you yourself have an ID that you can crop to, which is kind of a hack, if somehow. But uh, anyway, I think that in, in general, uh, it seems that there might be agreement that uh, capturing a subframe, like capturing an element is kind of making sense. In a similar vein, uh, we are seeing that uh, full screening an element is making sense to uh, websites. So um, maybe we could at least here uh, get a consensus on, on that. And then we can discuss exactly how we could do that. And for instance, whether we want to have this very dynamic or whether it's at uh, the capturing start that we want to say, hey, this is the, the element of the iframe, the scope where we want to capture, and it will not change. And once we have those discussions, then we can figure out maybe uh, the particular API. So I would try to get consensus on the cropping use case and maybe changing the cropping first. And once we have that, then we, we can figure out the, the API. And I, I kind of like the idea that we we should be able to to crop. It, it makes sense to me. So can I record that as consensus that uh, cr that cropping is uh, desirable feature is uh, has been achieved? Okay, Derek. Well, for for screen capture, right? Yeah, for screen capture. Yeah, and uh, the details are in the the devils are in the details. Should we then move on to? Our next subject. Um, if we are not too short on time, I would just like to try to get a better understanding of what we don't yet have consensus over. The API surface. OK. Uh, so, But I think the biggest open uh, question is whether we want to get viewport media, whether it should already crop to itself, or if it should always get the entire uh, viewport. And I hope that I've managed to convince you that it should always get the entire viewport unless it specifies otherwise. I, I disagree. 
Okay, uh, but that's a good question for the group. So I, does anybody else have an opinion? I, I would think that in general, uh, I would uh, try to capture myself as a context and the context is an iframe. And that's what I would try to do. And if we want to do something bigger, it, it should be up to the web page to do something more than that. Absolutely. You know, like, uh, the capturing web page, the capturing document. Uh, if it wants to capture more than itself, then it's fine if it does something more than that. Uh, if, the, if the goal is to capture the whole page, then the easiest path is probably for the top document uh, to capture itself. And what to, if to I clarify, want... though, yeah. It, it, yeah, it will capture the intersection of its iframe and everything else in that viewport, right. Right. which could include other things on top or underneath. But that means that whenever I want to iframe some VC, I need to set up a very elaborate collaboration with it, where basically it sends me a message saying, hey, I want you to capture everything on my behalf. Oh, I'm sorry. I want you to capture the interesting part on my behalf and send it over. Where, or Assuming you don't want to crop, OK? So you're, it's, might, might not even be a VC. So you're embedding something that you want to allow to capture. Now it cannot capture everything unless it first asks you to do that and then uh, send the track back. And I'm not sure why we need this uh, uh, limitation. So I wasn't following. Uh, but As I think in general, you have to have some buy-in from the, tar the target being captured, because they're getting a, a signaling channel here already. They can resize the frame whenever they want and have a significant impact on the output. So uh, having buy-in from the capture, capture uh, is important. The outline of my argument is this. First, I'm trying to say, hey, get viewport media should always get the entire viewport and not a cropped version just to itself unless we add something. So the default needs to be get the entire viewport. And if I convince you of that, then I need to. Uh, then it would be easier to convince you that okay, now we need to also add cropping on top of that. So for the first argument of the entire viewport is what you should get by default from get viewport media. I claim that when you iframe something, when you embed something, and you give it permission, that's not a lot of work, and that's a reasonable amount of work to expect of the application. But if now you say, OK, but every time you embed something and give it permission, you also need to commit to set up some kind of API between you, a post message based API for, if you ever want to capture, send me this message, and I'll capture and send it back the track. Okay, we're out of time here. We're out of time. OK. I just want to clarify that I still believe that having get display media uh, tied to a frame is the capture solution. Do we, do we know what the next step is on this presentation? What do we do next? And what the uh, summary is? We record consensus that, is that, that cropping is interesting. And we, we record, record that we do not have consensus on the, on the cropping mechanism. It would be good to know what the working group needs to make a decision on uh, which approach to take, because we've spent a couple of times now, both Elad and I, to present different avenues. And we haven't really heard uh, much about what the working group prefers. It would, it would be very nice to have input from the, other, from the other participants, yes. I think we have to take that on the bug, given that, uh, that, we're, that we're out of time. Yeah, I think that also it, it's going to be very difficult, uh, regardless of cropping, to continue to get viewport media without resolving this point, because you would like it to only capture the frame from which it's called. And we are, at least right now, totally unconvinced. So, uh, and once we resolve that, I imagine that cropping will just follow us uh, as a natural progression from whatever we agree on. Probably okay, we, we have, to, we, we have to move yeah. on. We have to move on. Okay. Thank you very much. OK, so going to another world where data is no longer raw, it's encoded. Uh, so we're shifting to WebRTC encoded transform and S-Frame. So there we are talking about the S-Frame transform, which is implementing the S-Frame algorithm natively. And S-Frame processing can generate errors, like you do not have the key ID, so or the message that you receive is uh, has an error, like uh, parsing fails, or you're decrypting and you're validating the authentication tag, and it's 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 not correct. Um, so there are a bunch of errors there, and 
since it's a native transform, um, it's good if there's a hook provided so that JavaScript can register to those events and say, hey, oh, there's a missing key ID, maybe I should do something. Or, oh, there's a lot of authentication errors, so maybe there's a potential attack. What should I do? Maybe I should drop the connection. So I think it's useful to surface these errors to the JavaScript application. There's another question, which is whether the native transform by itself should have a default behavior in case, for instance, of authentication error. Um, for now, there's no default behavior, so it will continue uh, working. And it's up to the JavaScript uh, to actually do something. But that's something we could continue discussing in the future. So the proposal, uh, yeah. So the question that we are trying to solve here is whether we should surface to JavaScript these errors and how we could do so. So the proposal is to expose error event handlers to on the S-frame transform object. Um, these events can be used if S-frame transform is used standalone. So you're assigning the S-frame transform to the standard transform, for instance. And in case, oh, well, yeah, it, it, would, it would probably be receiver that transform. But anyway, it's the same. So in, in case you're missing a key ID, then you do some JavaScript that will handle the unknown key. So probably in that case, it will register a new key and processing will continue. Uh, on the right side, we are seeing an example where the s transform can be used as part of RTC script transform. So the example is doing like something like a first transform, which is parsing some metadata uh, or generating some metadata. And then the second transform is the s transform. Uh, so let's say we have authentication error there. Maybe there should be like an, a method accumulating the errors. And if there are like too many authentication errors, uh, the JavaScript application will call peer connection close or something like that, because probably you're under attack. So that's the proposal here, a simple event, er error event uh, with like a few properties that are defined in, in a PR 103. Feedback? Yeah, I have a question, Yuen. How does this interact with knacking? So, you know, you're, you say, uh, you know, you're, I guess you've, by the time you've already gotten this, it's already past the UDP checksum and everything. Correct. Um, so now you're, uh, so, so basically there's no need to feed that back into the NAC mechanism, right? Is that what you're saying? Correct. You're just it, getting it, it, info that it, that it, it flunked the, the inner payload auth check. Yes, that's correct. Uh, knacking would be done before that. Uh, if you have a packet loss or something like that, or SRTP is, is broken. Uh, there, it's really the application level. You have some data, and the application data is not following the application um, protocol. So the application needs to handle it. Yeah, do you need, I'm just thinking if you need more info, like, you know, because uh, I know this is the native transform, so it's a little bit different than a JavaScript one. Um, but, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, so, I, 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 yeah, go ahead. So the, the S-frame specification is still a bit light, but at some point right. it will define some uh, processing and in that processing steps, it will say, oh, this is an error. And the idea is that we will uh, expose all the errors from the S-frame spec uh, in this event handler. So far, uh, the spec is still a bit rough, so we have a list yeah. that I that I've listed there. But it could be extended, and it it should match basically the SFRAN spec. Yeah, I'm just um, wondering, just because it's a native transform, what kinds of actions JavaScript will own? I mean, normally, like for example, in IPsec, you'll have replay windows and everything. You know, you'll have certain things that your whole implementation will do. But here, we're just saying it's it's mostly native, so it's only stuff that. That the app, you know, most of it is handled in the browser, I guess. Um, yeah. And yeah. So. So. Yeah, the, the two actions I see right now is is if, if there are too much parsing or authentication errors or replay errors, replay uh, errors, right? Then, then the SFU is trying to attack us, attack you. So you you, you should. Or somebody in between it. or something, yeah. Some, some somebody between, yeah. But it, it's already it's already it already broke then SFTP. So. Right. You know. Right. <laughs> 
And the other possibility is you have an application level issue, like you, you missed a key ID, you, you're missing a key. So then right. the action is, is to register a key based on the key ID and maybe to, to get a new one or I, I don't know, something like that. And th these are the two kind of actions I see Jeff, JavaScript applications take. Yeah, I'm just wondering so, whether there's any, is like anything else you might want to do, like go get a key and rerun things with a new key. You know what I'm saying? Uh, uh, any other actions that JavaScript might want to take? Um, so, so if you, if you, yeah, go ahead. No, I had a separate question. Oh. I'll take it after. Okay. Uh, I, I guess if you want to replay things past the error, uh, the script transform will probably try to buffer things, like buffer uh, the frames, the encoded frames, and, and do something. Uh, the native transform by on, on its own will not try to do buffer or replay things because it's really application uh, specific code. So if we see that it's happening a lot, maybe the native transform will not be enough useful. And then we will say, okay, we need to do something more and add some more uh, intelligence to the native transform. But from the beginning, I would just say, let's try to just implement the, the native SPM transform. In most cases, there will be no error mechanism, no errors. So no, not a lot of error events. And, and then we, we will be good there. Uh, my comment was that, so when this on error hap, uh, fires, uh, that's terminal. That's uh, fatal. No. No. If you no. if you have like uh, a missing key ID, uh, if you mm -hmm. if you're not reacting to that, uh, then you you might have maybe the key ID will be changed or maybe you will get this event again. There's a slight issue in terms of whether you will be flooded with events. That, that's a potential concern there. Uh, but in practice, I'm hoping it's not. It should not be too much. So, are there no errors that should be fatal, or that would be fatal? Like in the example on the right, you have a pipe. You're missing a catch statement on the pipe, by the way. So, are there cases where the S frame would cause the pipe to fail? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think there's any okay. S frame specification fatal error there. Okay. Thanks. So to me, this uh, looks like a reasonable approach in that uh, you basically have data flowing through the transform and then uh, errors go out the middle. The other alternative would be, have been to package them somehow and send them downstream together with the frames. And right. That uh, means that you would have all receivers of the, of the streams to able to handle multiple types of frames, which is a, not quite a compatible change, I think. Yeah, I mean, one of the key issues here is gonna be rekey, because you have to know exactly when you rekey, and if you do it before or after you should, then you're gonna get these key errors, and then the question is how you recover the, the uh, rekey and stuff like that. Anyway. Yeah, I'm hoping in most cases that you will uh, register the key before. And the s frame specification is trying to provide some guidelines that you do not end up in into those missing key cases because you will, in that case, you will probably drop drop uh, chunks on the floor and you will have to ask right. for a new keyframe and so on and it, it will be it it will be bad. So I'm hoping yeah. most applications will try to avoid getting into those errors. Yeah, I think there's a need for another event for a rekey. Like if the key schedule changes, you the JavaScript may need to know that and you go fetch another key. Like it can, uh, it it may get it may get as incoming packets that indicate that it's a different key ID, like that that the key got changed on the other side. Uh, that oh, okay. Uh, that's a different mechanism. Uh, yeah, we could we could we could think of that. Uh, so you're saying if the key ID is changing, even though I already registered the key, so everything is functioning, then maybe I want an event to know that the key ID changed. Is that correct? Right, like I'm the receiver and I see, I start getting packets. I don't have the, it's like the key, somehow the key exchange, I didn't get it. And I start getting something with a new key schedule. I'm gonna start getting these errors. But, um, you know, I, I, I need to have an event. Hey, d dude, you should, you need another key or the key schedule that, change that's or the something. Event there. You, yeah. That's the event, even type equal key ID, then. You, you okay. Yeah. yeah. Because there's a type uh, for the error. So if you have authentication error, it's different. Then key ID missing error, then parsing error. Okay. 
So based on the type, you will do that, that processing. So we got uh, three minutes left, and I think think we have a rough consensus that we should continue pursuing this. And this is, of course, ha of course, has to track the key S frame spec pretty close. Yes, and it's only the S only specified for the S frame. It's possibly a pattern that other other transforms can use, but uh, and in the specification, it's only on the S frame. Okay. Can we go to the next slide then and record that uh, we, we can proceed with the PR modulo changes? So the next issue is um, web codec encoded chunks versus RTC encoded chunk frames. So currently we have WebRTC encoded transform that has its own um, object for uh, representing encoded frames. And web codecs also has the same things. And they're kind of similar, but they have differences. Web codec current uh, proposal is to have immutable encoded frames. On the other end, for WebRTC encoded transform, the idea is really that you take a frame, you change uh, the, the data of a frame, but not, not anything else. You will not change the metadata, you will not change the timestamps, you will not change anything else, and then you, you send them to, to either the decoder or, or the packetizer. And to have good properties, the data ownership in WebRTC and Code Transform is transferred at the right step. So JavaScript, even though they, they will try to change uh, the, the data after uh, sending it, uh, it, will, it will not change how uh, the packetizer or the decoder will, will, will proceed, process data. And also, since we are RTC and web codec is more generic, there are some specific metadata exposure. So the question is, should we try to bring all of these together or should we just uh, try to have two uh, similar code paths, two, two similar constructs that are slightly different? Uh, next slide. So yeah, we, we could go with status quo, uh, which is currently to have two different constructs. So we keep a frame for which we can change the data attribute. And we can reuse, of course, a lot of subtypes, like uh, the type of the key frame, the, the type of uh, the frame would probably be shared. And the metadata, uh, the application metadata, and uh, several things would be uh, shared, the timestamp, and so on. So, we, we could use like duct typing, basically, like WebSocket is doing with RTC data channel, wherever it makes sense. Or we could try to merge the two APIs. And then if we merge the two APIs, we need uh, to agree either to go with web codec immutability, which is not uh, matching very well with the transform model, but uh, at least we would have that. So we would probably have a need to add something like clone this frame, but change the data method. And we would probably also to extend web frame metadata for RTC use cases as well. Um, so initially I was thinking about going with just one construct, but now I think that uh, we have, uh, we, we could also use two different constructs. It, it's not like we, we are, like it's not a lot of complexity to implement both. It's there's not a lot of uh, sharing code. There would be a, some sharing code. It doesn't seem like it will harm too much developers also. So I would go with the easy path and uh, keep status quo. But I'm happy to hear about uh, others. So uh, I always uh, thought that uh, making them different was a mistake. And the main reason why they turned out different was that uh, the, the, the transform had to had to be released first, and so, and it's a it's a bad thing that we haven't managed to align them afterwards. Now, uh, you're right about the the processing model being slightly awkward in uh, in the, when you have an immut immutable frame. And you probably have to do special tricks for making it effective. 
But if you don't have the same type and you want to connect a web codec to a transform, to, a, to an encoder transform, then you have to, in addition to the processing, you have to insert a transform step, which you probably, probably could specify as a native transform if you really wanted to and uh, speed up with all kinds of tricks, but it, it seems awkward. Uh, well, uh, traditionally in web codecs, we, we've defined other methods to transform into different data types. So that, you know, the, you could do a transform or you could have like a web codecs method to, uh, you know, transform it into something else. Um, so I don't know that this is a huge obstacle, the difference. I think it could be smoothed over, but I think it is something that does need to be uh, looked at more. Because, uh, I, you know, for example, the encode, it should be, it, we should be able to use web codecs with end-to-end -end encryption too, right? In an easy way. Yeah, so for the end-to-end -end encryption, VS Frame Transform is taking uh, RTC encoded video frames, it's taking RTC encoded audio frames, and it's taking a uh, buffer source, which is a real buffer, basically. So it, could, it would be very easy uh, to take video frame, but uh, the model would be a bit different because then you you would need to create a different video frame, but I, I think it's fine. We would we would need to define a way to copy all the metadata, so really a clone, uh, and it would be implemented, it would be specified natively. And uh, if we go down that path, maybe we could add a method to in JavaScript to, to do that. I, I would dislike the idea that in WebRTC and Code Transform, you, you have to create a new object and you, you would have to copy manually all, all the properties and of course missing some uh, just to change one field. So we, we need, if we go down that path, we would really need to have like, uh, to add a new API. Yeah, I think we're out of time for this item, uh, but what, what, are, what do we take down for the minutes and next steps? I had a quick comment just that to quote you and from earlier that paraphrase to have both seems problematic <laughs> a different context but uh, uh has anyone in web codex considered uh an approach where these encoded chunks could be instead of immutable lockable or something like that bernard do you know uh yes and um, but i think we don't have time to talk about that here but we should bring right. it up yeah, yeah. So, so if how, we could raise that issue we... that'd be great okay continue discussion in the back So just to be clear, how should we make progress there? Should, should there, Bernard, should, should you, should we have uh, my recommendation you, him, or? My, my recommendation, UN, is to actually uh, raise an issue in the web codex repo relating to um, the uh, relating to the immutable locking issue. Because I think that's part of what you brought up. Yeah, but I, I tried to push for mutable and uh, clearly uh, I, I got feedback that <laughs> they do not no, they really do not want to change that. So maybe they will be okay with lock. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Uh, I, I can take an action to find an issue on web codec repo. Uh, yeah, I'm not sure where it where it will go. Right. Yeah. And uh, uh, since uh, we have changed out the means of getting streams in uh, in the spec. It would be nice to have uh, the change of uh, of buffer format done at the same time. Mm -hmm. Break it once, break it once, break it twice. You're going to be un more unpopular. Okay, next to next topic. Hey, that's me. <laughs> yeah. you're the back. Thank you. Okay. So I tried to pick through the list of issues that uh, are open on media capture transform and which of them have, has generated the most heat and possibly block progress. So I picked out three that I want to discuss here and uh, one that I su suggest that we, that we don't use our, the time for. And so uh, more items are in last month's slides. I tried on these slides to actually present 
the issues are not what I want to do, do about them. So, except in one case, which is next slide. We have had an open item on discussing whether readable stream and writable stream are the right approach. And I believe that we have had sufficient discussion and uh, a sufficient lack of alternatives that uh, uh, we can conclude that this is the right approach. Developers like it. We have no, not seen significant downsides of using it identified for our use cases. So my suggestion is that we adopt this as our strategy for now and move on. Get it off the table. You when you had it, raised your hand. Yep. Um, so I would say that uh, the GitHub thread is very active. Uh, is it? And with Guido, we, we made a lot of progress. Uh, we tried to do some te uh, temporary conclusion. And I think that we, we have some consensus on some points, not on others. And, uh, but at least we had consensus on the idea to get feedback from more people, and which maybe we could try to do at next interim. And the second thing is that uh, it might be time, uh, for instance, for me, to provide alternative APIs. You are mentioning that there's a lack of alternative APIs. Uh, I can take an action for next interim to actually provide alternative APIs or maybe scope it down to just one alternative API so that we can discuss things. Uh, I think uh -huh. Guido raised the valid point that uh, I was mentioning that uh, readable stream, writable stream has a cost. And he, he mentioned maybe that uh, to evaluate the cost, you really need to see alternatives and then you can compare. And I agree with that. So that's why I'm fine uh, trying maybe with Guido to first uh, summarize the GitHub issues and discussions uh, for next interim, and second, to present an alternative proposals. OK, I, I note that Yuan uh, has uh, suggested delaying the decision for one month. Other, other uh, Guido, Guido oh, would okay. you be fine? Guido, would you be fine uh, just trying to prepare slides to summarize this issue for next interim? Uh, With me? Yes, we can. We can together uh, uh, present what the status of the discussion we have at that time. Okay. And then, uh, cool. So let, let's follow up uh, offline and start yeah. doing these yeah. slides uh, in advance. Yeah. yeah. Is that that this issue we are discussing it no no longer on the on that number four issue, but in the web media capture extensions? Oh, you're uh, right. Yeah. yeah. So. So that's. Oh, uh, Oh, I see. That's uh, that's might be why I didn't. Oh, I was questioning the idea that yeah. the issue is active. Could yeah. somebody send me the URL for that so it gets into the notes? It it's uh, on the on the slide uh, th three slides further down. Yeah, I can't cut and paste from the slides though. No. <laughs> <laughs> well. Okay, you'll get that. Um, so are there, are there any other comments on this topic? OK, then we have consensus for the delay decision for one month. Well, when you say delay, what do you mean delay? That, we, mean do, that, that we do not take a decision on whether or not to go with, uh, with read, readable stream, writable stream. No. OK. We, we attempt to get the information we need to make a decision in one month from now. But that, does that delay a call for adoption? Because that's you can still adopt a spec and change, make changes to it, right? Of course, nope. but uh, but uh, I don't. I have not. I've I've not seen anyone suggest that we have a call for adoption now. Oh, okay. Yeah. Just trying to understand. Yeah. So uh, the other hot topic, and uh, we, where I tried to present a neutral slide. Uh, is that we have two trains of thoughts. One is that processing in workers should be easy. And the main thread processing should be possible, which is uh, the basic thrust of our initial proposal. 
And uh, the other approach, uh, I would say that worker processing should be mandatory, which is the encoder stream uh, uh, version that uh, UN is advocating. And main thread processing should be hard or impossible. That's the proposals that include making media stream track generator and media stream track processor worker only constructs. So far, just about every argument made that I've heard, at least the loudest ones, have come from uh, UN, Jan Ivar, and me, basically three browser vendors. Uh, so I would very much like to hear the, uh, on this point, input from uh, people who are not browser vendors. That is the rest of the working group. But just, just to be before that, uh, I would not think that what I'm suggesting or what Yoniva is pushing is to make worker processing mandatory. It's already possible to do a mainframe through Canvas and it's working. Right, right. Uh, I, I think what we are, what what are, we are suggesting is to first try to solve uh, the use cases of uh, raw media capture in a worker environment, and then as a first step, because that's we we know. I think we agree that it's the best way, and we can, as a follow-up step, yep. work on main thread processing. Maybe that. Uh, that's what I'm more suggesting. It's not like worker processing should be mandatory and forbid main thread. But that's not what I'm suggesting. Well, uh, that's not how your proposals have come across, yeah. Well, I would paraphrase it as saying that uh, main thread processing is irresponsible. I think that's we should have APIs that guide people strongly toward workers without necessarily making it totally impossible to then transfer the result back to a main thread if you really want to. And I think this is uh, doubly important with things like funny hats, because uh, you often want to self-view. If you're, if I have a funny hat, I want to see myself with a hat as well as uh, the other side should see it. So I have to bring it back to main thread. So it's going to be very uh, deceptive to. It's going to be very tempting. This is deceptive is the wrong word. Tempting to do it all in main thread because if I transfer it to a worker, I'm going to have to transfer the result back for my self-view. So yes, I, I would definitely I'd like to hear from all this. Yeah, I can actually give a comment because I've been working on an application that uh, actually only uses the main thread and it works fine. I was surprised that it works so well. Uh, so, and the, the, uh, the comment was that it uses, it, it's a game streaming thing that uses MSE, right? And, you know, you have to look, you have to look at whether in that kind of situation, MSE doesn't work in a thread. So, you know, if you do this and, and, and you say something like web codex decode, it essentially provides the same, uh, the same functionality as MSE. And if MSE doesn't work on a worker thread, right, uh, then you might want to do this in main thread. I'm not saying that's, that you couldn't improve it by also supporting it in a worker thread, but I don't see why you would prohibit it in main thread if all you want to do is substitute like media uh, stream track generator and web codex for MSE. I think there were there were talks for MSE in a worker, and I'm not sure. Where, yeah, I'm, where, I'm just saying. Called, but, uh, yeah. yeah, I'm just saying it's moving to a worker, but it it wasn't it isn't in a worker today, and if you just want to use this as a substitute for MSE, you know nobody has said that MSE shouldn't be allowed should only be allowed in a worker, right? It it does function. So I, I do understand Jan Eva's argument that some things might be such heavy processing that they would be they should be done in a worker, but not everything is. So so it should be also known that MSC is uh, not real time. It means you do fetch in main thread and you, you get a chunk and then you put the chunk in, in the meta pipeline and there there's there's a lot of buffering there. But there's a lot of buffering of the encoded data, not of the raw media data. So that, that makes a real difference. This API is targeting raw media data. We are talking about taking the input of a camera and do that uh, in main thread and hoping that it's. Uh, Yuan? Yuan? I specifically would like to hear from people who are not you. <laughs> I'm muted. <laughs> Uh, 
All right, I see a lot of hands. Yeah. Tim, who has maybe Tim, who has raised his hand. And... Yeah. Um, I, um, so I have a, I have a, uh, a feeling that it would be clearer to do this in a worker and make it easier. Like, if there's a choice between making it easier to do it in main thread and easier to do it in the worker, it should be easier to do it in the worker. Like, the assumption should be that, you know, where you introduce a developer to this concept, that the example is doing it through a worker. And if for some debugging reason or for some other complexity you end up wanting to do it in the, in the main thread, then, okay, maybe that should be possible. But I really think that the default should be off main thread. And I'm thinking about, like, the low-spec multi-core machines. I think that's where this makes a difference. Uh, I, I think, uh, well, well I, I have to check that for myself, but actually what I've heard from the media people in Chromium is that it's in low spec machines where, where workers do not make a difference. That's the, that's the argument. Maybe maybe we have someone from from media here. I don't know if, if Thomas has uh, some comments uh, there. I am. Um, I do not know about that portion specifically. Um, yeah, well, we do always offload everything. We're not actually doing any decoding on the main thread, just to clarify, but I think maybe everybody knew that. Um, but I don't know about the performance for like low spec uh, hardware for um, yeah. yeah. I think it was Dale who had that comment, but yeah, I I, I did I haven't asked him for for clarification. But anyway, I do I do know a use case that uh, uh, that someone uh, uh, mentioned in the well, in the context of of, of colleagues, but also in the context of of. Uh, um, the capture transform that uh, uh, for example they have an application that it's a an inter, like a, an internal uh, prototyping application for effects and they write it using a language that transpiles to javascript it's, it's not uh, like pure, pure javascript and then uh, it's it's an application that it's a production application but internal not 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 a video conferencing application it's just to to evaluate uh, to prototype effects and things like that and they say that uh, the ha using a worker there is is uh, not only unnecessary but also complicates their application a lot because using a worker when you are transpiling it's 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 a big pain so so for their application that it's um uh, I mean, that, that doesn't need to do a lot of I/O because it's it's a it's 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 just an internal application for prototyping uh, uh, effects. Uh, actually, main thread is the best solution. Uh, so, so that that's an example of of, of use cases that uh, where the main thread is actually uh, our choice. Uh, so, yeah, those examples exist. We just need to ask enough web developers to. Uh, so, so making it uh, extremely, exceedingly difficult to use the main thread for 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 use cases like this uh, seems uh, kind of counterproductive. I I, I have a proposal to to uh, to keep the objects as they are and just making them fail, fail by default if you use them on the main thread, so that you need to pass an additional parameter when you construct them to enable their use on the main thread. So that so that the application needs to intentionally want to use the main thread. So so by default, I mean, would address the issue of 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 not allowing main thread by default, but not making it exceedingly difficult. Uh, I don't know if that's uh, enough uh, difficulty, but because you, you have said that that it should not be impossible, uh, but it should not be default. So so this meets those two things, but I don't know if it's hard enough in the way you envision it. Uh, I think Matt Gordon is in the queue. I can't see everybody. Uh, hey, everyone. Um, my name is Matt. I work on um, the Xbox game streaming cloud, cloud gaming product. Um, I've been listening in for a couple of iterations, but uh, I'd like to introduce myself first. Um, the thing I wanted to sort of 
offer to this discussion is, is just some sort of practical um, discoveries from running a cloud gaming thing in a web browser. And, and one of those is that um, we actually hit quite a lot of major GC hiccups trying to run everything on the main thread because you know, we build a web app like everyone else does. We pull in literally tens of thousands of NPM packages. We don't really know, you know, in great detail what the fine-grained behavior of those packages is. And so the main thread gets pretty blocked up. Um, and then, you know, major GCs come along and they take, some of them take long enough that it causes hitches in your frame processing when you're trying to do media stuff. So um, we do do quite a bit of media processing on the main thread because, you know, things like MSC have to happen there. But from a practical point of view, it would actually be nice if we could move everything media processing into a web worker because then we can focus on that environment and we can just put our media processing stuff in there and tightly control it and try and manage the rate that GC is happening at so that we don't get these hiccups. Um, so, you know, from, from an adoption point of view, it would be convenient for us if, you know, we can always do stuff on the main thread because we're always migrating, right? And, you know, a larger number of smaller changes is easier for us to manage. Um, but from a practical point of view, like garbage collection tends to interrupt frame pacing and, you know, we like to get a smooth 60 FPS for as long as we can. I think I think we have a total consensus that uh, uh, working, worker processing needs to be very easy. And uh, probably so easy that it is the first thing we present when we do examples. Well, I would go further and say it's it should be so easy that it is the default. Well, uh, what, what the, I would uh, yeah. what, what I would not agree with is that uh, that uh, me, that main thread processing for the cases where you want it should be so hard that uh, pe that people don't do it because they give up, not because they don't need it. I want them not to need it. Well, yeah, I don't think the bar needs to be that high, but. Uh, if maybe, that's, uh... maybe what could be done is uh, once we have APIs, uh, we, we, we look at the APIs in workers, and then we, we look at what, it, what, what would be the cost of uh, writing a shim so that it's also exposed uh, in the window environment, for instance. And this will give us a rough idea of the complexity uh, of each proposal. I don't see any other hands, so maybe, can I go? Yeah. <laughs> All right. So I would just say that, uh, yes, I think we should, the spec should be very clear that we expose this to workers. I don't think we should go out of our way to prevent the result from ending up in main thread. But I also think that uh, Surma has a great presentation on YouTube you can find that says the main thread is overworked and underappreciated. That talks about how modern devices with higher frame rates often reduces your real time budget from 17 milliseconds down to 11. And having garbage collection on the main thread, but also uh, a lot of active user uh, user activity that can cause all kinds of events, which means you, the main problem is often getting on the main thread, which, because you come behind all these other events that have already, uh, other tasks that have already been queued. So you're dealing with large queues of tasks and garbage collection. And that's an inhospitable environment for real-time media processing which I think we sometimes neglect to focus on because uh, I think there's one use case that hasn't been mentioned, which I would call Zoom on the web, where it's not really that real time because the end result is web codecs. And we don't actually mention web codecs as a use case in, in the breakout box spec. Uh, but the one that is mentioned, funny hats, you do have a real time budget that's quite short and doing that on the main thread, I think would be uh, prohibitive, maybe not on your fastest machines, but you know we want it to work everywhere. Well, it turns out not to be, but that's uh, beside the point. Um, we tried it. Anyway, so uh, so let, let's jump to another. Uh, so I think we have rehashed the arguments. Is there a um, way to make progress there? And uh, I think we have, uh, I see some softening in that. Uh, we seem to agree that that it uh, it's not fatal for the for the API proposal to make it possible to do work on the main thread. So, uh, 
I think we need to come up with specific proposals. And one of the course of the specific, specific proposal is actually the next slide, which is uh, the media capture extension, extension number 16, issue number 16. And that's off main thread processing without, without, I mean, there are multiple cases where, where it makes sense to transfer media stream tracks between contexts. And off main thread processing, where we instantiate these things on the, on the, off the main thread, and requires this. So we actually have two proposals and two differences between them, which means we actually have four proposals, but it's only two of them written out. And one of them is that tracks are transferable and entangled with the original context. And the other one is that they are serializable and uh, the lifetime is tied to the original source. So uh, we had some interesting discussion on what is a source. I sometimes think that we made a mistake back in 10 years ago when we decided not to represent sources explicitly, but that's another matter. So the, the difference between the, a serializable media stream track and a transferable media stream track is actually quite small. It's whether or not the original track survives when you send it. Of course, if you want to destroy it, you can. But uh, either by including it in a transfer list or by, by simply stopping it after you've sent it. But uh, the, the UN's original proposal was transferable and entangled. So I think we all, I think we have consensus that we need this tool. And uh, exactly what the tool should like, like, look like is now up to making a proposal. So now I invite any comments. Um, this is you went just to, to state that um, there are two things that would be good to get from the working group. Um, I think there are two items that we need to define, to decide uh, whether we want to move our copy is, the, is one item that we should decide. And the other choice we need to make is what is the lifetime? And I think they are totally independent. So if we, I, like we have I, four choices basically. I agree. They are in two different pull requests at the moment, uh, which is the only reason why they touch on, touch on each other. So we have four, we have four, we can combine these two in four, in four ways, yes. Yeah, I would say, and Harald said he promised to come back to a solution. So I also like the idea of transferring media stream track. So one solution might be, for instance, to the earlier problem we discussed would be only expose the method that allows processing on the media stream track in the worker. And then uh, if you get a track back that you would use want to use on the main thread, you can always transfer it back. So then your process, your, you can transfer media stream track, not just from main thread to a worker, but from a worker to main thread for good defaults. As to the question of clone, uh, move versus copy on, on the list, I'm preferential to toward move because uh, tracks already are clonable. You can create these clones, but it's a leaky API where JavaScript already today is forced to hunt down every clone they've ever created with track clone and make sure to call stop on all of them before. Uh, and if they don't do that, uh, you, they might get a resource leak of uh, like the hardware camera light would stay on until garbage collection happens. So it's introducing a leaky API to JavaScript, which isn't the best, but we did it for tracks and clones. And since we already have clone, I think if we could pick uh, move semantics, it seems more natural to pick move semantics because if you wanted to copy, you can always call clone and then transfer the clone. You could of course go make the same argument the other way. They can always copy by default 
And uh, if you didn't want the copy, you could call stop. But there's a cost to having these copies, so I would pick the one where you don't end up with unnecessary copies if you make a mistake. Because every track is going to have its own constraints, which are going to be a burden on upstream if it has multiple clients it needs to <clears throat> resize uh, graphics toward. And also, once we start uh, adding transforms, these are always also going to be <clears throat> uh, part of a single track and not all tracks. And we haven't even actually talked about, I, I assume if you clone a track that's already been transformed, you're cloning the transformed result, uh, which we also should make sure to state somewhere. So I'm for fewer copies. Um, ju just to, to state that uh, it, it's not only a main thread to work or work at the main thread. Uh, there, there are other use cases that, uh, for instance, we, we talk with Elad, where it's uh, one iframe to another, for instance, and there might be use cases there as well. And it's important to keep that in mind. Um, totally. I think we're almost out of time. We're at about two minutes left. Um, do we have a summary here on uh, next steps? So uh, we have to pick. Uh, so we, we didn't go into the lifetime issue yet, unfortunately. So uh, I think the original context is a bad, uh, bad idea. And uh, I, I like the lifetime of the source much better. Uh, but uh, I could, I could frankly flip a coin on the other one. Is there consensus to uh, select move then? Can you say that? Uh, any other input from people who are not UN and Jan and you or me? I'd have to understand the performance impact of these two different things. I mean, just because you have a copy doesn't necessarily mean that there's, uh, you know, there's additional overhead in the track itself, right? Well, it might unless the browser optimizes and notices there's no sync. Right, right. You can have both. I mean, it can be serializable and transferable. Right, right. So it's not that you have to choose one, only one of them. Yeah, you could have, you, you could have both. And, and then it, you would invoke the copy semantics if you don't include the, the it in the transfer list and uh, the transfer semantics if you do. I, I'm quite opposed to copy. Uh, I think we have to be more prudent. You want to make copy more difficult. <laughs> yes. It seems we could start with zero copy and <laughs> add to the ball if we need to as well. So transfer seems a, a bit more safer. It doesn't buy, buy any safety since, since user can bypass it. But, yeah. what, what are the benefits of serializable? It's a, it's a simple definition. Uh, that I, I don't think I agree. I think most of the uh, complexity of a transfer PR is related to uh, lifetime management. If we remove the lifetime management, then the PR is uh, uh, not exactly the same, but there will be like four lines that, are, that will be different, but it's not a, a big deal. Yeah. Okay, if you, if, if you remove the lifetime management uh, special handling, then uh, I think I could, I, I could live with serializable and with transferable. Trans okay. Okay, um, we, we could do that and uh, file another issue for how we define precisely uh, um, ma like lifetime management, which we need to do uh, either by more having a better definition of sources that we are missing right now or uh, with something else. Yeah, sounds good to me. Okay, we have probably okay. on that list. Right okay, I think that. Well, I yeah, can you, Bernard, can you summarize what I should write in the notes for that? I'm slightly I, lost. I, the I, think, uh, I think we had consensus for transferable at least first. Is that right, uh, Harold? 
Yes. And and no decision on the lifetime management needs more discussion. Yes. yes. Okay. There's a new issue. Yeah, no issue. Okay. Well, we finally reached the uh, the end of the presentation. I think that's the first time in like three meetings. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is an this is an iguana. So enjoy. <laughs> You ran out the birds? Is it a bird? Yeah. It, no, it's no, it's not a bird. It's a lizard. Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Ciao. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi. I don't remember to stop the recording. <laughs>